So, good afternoon and welcome back to the next panel of our international conference, the other 68 anthropophagic revolutions in Brazilian counterculture after 1968. My name is Laura Teixeira. I'm very happy to be chairing this um, panel here in the afternoon. We're going to have three presentations. Um, and um, first of all, I apologize a little bit for the delay, but I was just joking before we were doing this in the Brazilian uh, way, which is always uh, punctuality is not exactly our strength. And I'm glad that this is working also in the German environment. Um, a few. Um, uh, Information before we begin, I was informed by our lovely helpers at the entrance that there is a um, presence, a list for, for the, uh, where we're asking everybody to sign that they have been present to the conference. So both the guests and the people attending, it would be great if you could just sign. It's more for us to have an idea who was there, to have like a, a document and, um, for, for the structure, for the organization of the event. So um, when we're done, it would be great if you could just quickly uh, give your autogram in the list outside. Uh, we also have posters of the conference, so if anybody wants to take posters home, uh, we have a bunch of those also at the entrance, so you can get them. Um, and uh, for the guests, uh, I also would like to give the uh, nice information that uh, with this badge, if you show that in the entrance of the Few Museum, we, you can get a ticket to visit the exhibition. I wouldn't have mentioned that yesterday, but I forgot. So uh, in case you still manage to find time to do that, we have the um, the permanent exhibition and the temporary exhibition about 2001, an Odyssey uh, space. So whoever still finds time and wants to visit the exhibition is welcome to stop by the Few Museum. Okay, now to our panel. Uh, we have um, called it uh, revolutionary, revolutionizing art. So we're going to have three um, lectures this afternoon on uh, topics of visual arts. And we're going to start uh, with uh, uh, very interesting topic already. I'm very curious to see what Moacir dos Anjos is going to tell us about an underdeveloped art and uh, how that con concept um, evolves. Um, brief introduction to Moacir. He um, is a senior researcher at the Fundação Joaquim Nabucco in Recife. And I also thought it was interesting that this morning we were talking about the Dutch Brazil and him coming from Recife. Um, probably has a different connection to that or a special connection to that. Um, um, I find it interesting that he will be bringing um, a perspective a little different from what we are also sometimes used to focusing on Rio and São Paulo when we talk about Brazil. So I'm very glad that Moacir dos Anjos is um, today here with us. He has been uh, curating um, many important exhibitions, um, not to mention the, the smallest is the uh, Brazilian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2011 uh, with the works from Arthur Barrio and at the 29th uh, São Paulo Biennale, which he curated as well, so um, not to mention a number of other exhibitions he can tell us about all his experience in the area of curating um, especially Brazilian art but not only. Um, I also find interesting that um, with a background that doesn't come as traditionally one would expect from art history but from economics uh, where he uh, earned his uh, PhD but then turned to visual arts where he has made an incredible career um, and we're very happy and honored to have your presence here. Thank you very much. Monsieur. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thanks for Vincent Paula for the invitation, Laura for the presentation, uh, for introduction. Uh, I'd like to start uh, this talk uh, trying to answer a very simple question. When it was 1968? To do so, I recall what the British historian Eric Hobsbawm once said about the 20th century. For him, what was th that was what he called a short century. It would have begun with the First World War in the mid-1910s and ended with the dissolution of the socialist bloc in the early 90s. It would be these two striking events that would distinguish the inauguration and the end of a unique historical period in which distinct forms of inhabiting the world were created and then exhausted. 
The years preceding and succeeding these limits, these boundaries, would therefore have been part of other times. In a similar, but also in a reverse way, it may be possible to consider 1968 as an extended year, which begins gradually from years before, maybe in the 50s, and ends in the course of the following decade. 68 would thus have been the catalyzed moment of process that preceded and survived that year. There is, however, no single event capable of unequivocally signaling the beginning of this extended year. Neither is it possible to clearly identify when it comes to an end. What's possible to say is that 68 is emblematic of the spirit of a time we're talking about in, in the lunch, the spirit of time of imprecise borders in which long-standing human relations partners were challenged otherwise like never before. To approach the events of 1968 requires, therefore, to consider several historical processes that overlap, come together, and sometimes clash to each other. Just as important, however, is to avoid the temptation of considering such events as the outcomes of changes originating in a specific field of life. For these, these changes express, on contrary, simultaneous transformations in different areas of life in which specific demands from well-defined social segments summed up with others, other demands that were admittedly diffuse, more a construction of a utop utopia, of a utopian becoming than a position taken in the face of a specific agenda. And if the, if the historical epicenter of these events was Paris, at least in the hegemonic imaginary of the time, in many other places they unfolded with a strong intensity and with emphasis specific to each situation, almost like a simultaneous worldwide uprising where a tacit agreement had been made to reinvent almost everything. There are many attempts to understand the motives, the motives, the reasons that led to this collusion of emancipatory motivations and moves in countries so far from each other geographically, culturally, and politically. Some historians emphasize, for example, the fact that it was in the mid-60s that students, one of the most important protagonists in, of much of these actions, have become a social and political important force in the most different countries. Others point out the role played by the unprecedented access to the mass media in the emergence of a feeling of change shared globally. There is no agreement, however, on these or other suggestions giving rise to the myth that goes around that year. In 1961, Brazilian composers Carlos Lira and Chico de Assis composed the music for a play named Un Americano in Brasilia, An American in Brasilia, with a special mention to the song of the underdeveloped, a canção do, desenvolvido, do subdesenvolvido. Launched on disc the following year, as part of the compilation O Povo Canta, the song mocked the economic, political, and cultural dependence of Brazil in relation to other countries. In each of its many stanzas, the song of the underdeveloped spoke of a specific period in the country's history, from the submission to Portugal as one of its colonies, to the influence of the United States in the life of Brazilians in the mid 20th century, pointing out the renewed forms of exploitation of its people for the benefit of foreign capital. At the end of each of these blocks, the, the chorus of the song was repeated between accusatory and provocative. It was Era um país subdesenvolvido, 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 and goes on. The great success of the song of the underdeveloped, mainly among the students, was followed shortly after the military coup of 1964 by the prohibition of the song being played 
being played in public. It's no wonder that the concept of underdevelopment has informed one of the most popular protest, song, protest songs at a time of great political and cultural vitality in Brazil, as it was the early 60s. Although well known for the conservative economic thought, the idea of underdevelopment gained new form and strength only in the post-World War II, as a result of the institutional and intellectual efforts made to think of the reconstruction of the world in an entirely changed environment, in which devastation and opportunity came together, and in which old truths were no longer taken for granted. And it was within the framework of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, CEPAL, an institution created by the United Nations in 1948 and based in Chile, that the term underdevelopment acquired not only greater density, but also renewed meanings, being gradually adopted as a central concept to the economic and social thought of those regions. And this change is largely due to the theoretical elaborations made by two economists, Raul Prebs from Argentina and Celso Furtado from Brazil. Broadly speaking, the greatest novelty of Sepal's conception of underdevelopment was the abandonment of a teleological view of the then hegemonic economic history. The abandonment of a view in, in which underdevelopment, with all the material deprivations that defined it, would be a stage to be inevitably overcome by the continued acceleration of economic growth. Sepal rejected, therefore, the somehow reassuring idea that development was to be the natural destination of the underdeveloped countries once their product and income grew steadily over time. They abandoned the misleading idea that it would be a matter of time for the then underdeveloped countries to stand by those already developed. Rather than conforming to the conception that there were steps to be taken and to be fatally defeated to achieve development, Prebich and Furtado made a concerted effort to understand the underdevelopment of Latin America, not as a phase or a stage, but as a condition. A condition whose origins dated back to the beginning of the colonial history, but which gained more precise contour, precise uh, contours in the 18th century with the accelerated industrialization of Western Europe and the consequent expansion of capitalist economies beyond their frontiers in order to realize their increased possibilities of material gain. This displacement of capital without the physical and symbolic violence that characterizes it achieved the regions already occupied with very old economic systems of a non-capitalist nature, creating dualistic structures within those countries, so that sectors that obeyed different economic criteria were reproduced in an articulated way. The internal duality of the underdeveloped economies was also expressed in the coexistence of a center and a periphery at world level. Center and periphery understood not as definitions of different stages in a development scale, in which the periphery would one day also be center. Instead, center and periphery understood as parts of a whole that are reproduced together in different rhythms, thus replicating the inequality that constitutes and defines this dual arrangement. For Sepal, therefore, the dynamics of the world economy engendered relations of dependence between different countries. Sepal understood and developed, therefore, as an autonomous historical process that guided, since that time and be still in force in the last century, the economic and social dynamics of countries located in different parts of the world. And if this arrangement obviously gained complexity over time, with the gradual strengthening of local industry, Sepal studies demonstrated that the gains generated by those industries remained unevenly distributed still in the 1960s, being uniquely appropriated by foreign firms. 
It should also be noted, that, however, that this diagnosis did not point to the immortality in, uh, of the condition of the underdevelopment. By calling attention to the historicity, historic, historicity of the constitution of these relations of dependence, that is, by making an effort to understand how, in each concrete case, the condition of underdevelopment was forged over time, it also pointed out to the possibility of intervening in that condition in order to force it to change. A change that would not only come simply with a greater growth of these economies, as it was previously thought, be necessary to radically transform their productive and social profile. Because of that, and also because of the acknowledgement that one lived it that one lived in an unequal environment that, that reproduced itself self, over time, Sepal developed a set of tools for planning and intervening in these economies in order to change, in order to overcome the condition of development, a process in which states should play a central role. Many of the theoretical and historical formulations associated with the new conception of underdevelopment were elaborated by Celso Furtado between the beginning of the 50s and the middle of the 60s. And his most important contrib contributions to the subject were gathered together in the book Teoria e Política do Desenvolvimento Econômico, published in 1967 on the eve of the, of the mythical year of 1968. There are several political actions that taken Brazil throughout the 60s and 70s indicate the centrality of this new way of thinking, the place of the country in the international context. Both the industrialization policies that marked the period, as well the resurgence of the emergency of a regional issue in Brazil, were informed by this then new conception of the underdevelopment. Even hegemonic leftist, leftist political strategies in the early 60s incorporated what was implicit in that concept, in that they focused their efforts more on alliance with the national bourgeoisie to face the power of the central economies than on facing the country's manifest class conflicts. Several cultural, cultural and artistic actions of that time were also made under the sign of underdevelopment. And now, enough of economics. And I will turn my attention to some of these cultural and artistic events, even if disregarding a rigid chronology of facts, and even if leaving most of them aside. One of the best known of these efforts was an attempt of the poet and writer Ferreira Goulart to think of the idea of avant-garde in the context of underdevelopment. Right in 1969, Goulart is aware of the dependent nature of that condition which defines Brazil and many other countries. Commenting on the economic impasses of the country at the time, he acknowledges the necessity to obtain technology from developed countries to supposedly overcome local underdevelopment. At the same time, however, he agrees that it's the same process, in, it's in the same process of acquisition and incorporation of knowledge from abroad that the mechanisms of structural domination of world capitalism would be reinforced. In such an environment in which a relationship of dependence is always reinforced, restored, a conception of artistic avant-garde, says Goulart, would have to tackle, to tackle questions different from those observed in developed countries. A conception of avant-garde appropriated to an underdeveloped, underdeveloped country would have, first and foremost, to take into account the national question. That's what Ferreira Goulart says in his essay on the subject. The definition of avant-garde art in an undeveloped country must arise from the examination of the social and cultural characteristics of that country and never from the acceptance of mechanical acceptance or mechanical transference of a concept of avant-garde which is valid to developed countries. 
And it's in this key that the writer, that Goulart, criticizes or praises diverse cultural and artistic movements of the, sixties, of the 50s and 60s in Brazil. He criticizes or praises these movements according to their lesser or greater capacity to take into account the subordinate integration of Brazil, including its culture, to the dynamics dictated by the developed countries. His critique of concretism and his, and his praise, indeed self-praise, for neoconcretism and his praise for Ligia Clark's, Ligia Clark's bichos and Eliot Sica's parangolés are part of this broader reason. While concretists would be disconnected from the Brazilian reality, emulating issues of an international avant-garde, the others, including himself, would be looking for original ways of critically connected, connecting to a situation of systemic dependence. This is perhaps the most relevant contribution of Goulart's essay to thinking of an art world, of an art that would be proper to the condition of underdevelopment, to defend what he called the national character of the aesthetic expression. National, says Goulart, not because it is nationalist or regionalist or folkloric or exotic, but because it is the concrete, particular expression of the universal in a given culture. And that's an idea that one can find in a significant part of the production associated with tropicalismo, as well as Cinema Novo, and the experimental field of visual arts in the late 6s and early 70s in Brazil. A production in which, and that's very important, a production in which underdevelopment assumes not only a connotation of lack, in which something is always missing, but also a connotation of potency, of vitality, for a unique understanding of the world. An understanding which bears, moreover, the germ of a political, social, and sensitive transformation. A notion of underdeveloped, of an undeveloped art that assumes, therefore, the paradoxical character of the environment where it is created, where something is lacking, but also there is a vitality to create something new. Writing in the early 70s, film critic Paulo Emilio Salles Gomes writes a text call it Cinema, Trajectory in Underdevelopment, in which he describes how the main movement associated with Brazilian cinema can be understood as responses, as responses given in different moments to the condition of underdevelopment to which the count was submitted. Condition that, affirmed, that he is affirmed in the opening of the text as he makes the following statement. American, Japanese, and general European cinema were never undeveloped whereas Hindu, Arabic, or Brazilian films never ceased to be. In film, underdevelopment is not a stage, a phase, but a state. The same that Curtado was saying before. The films of developed countries have never gone through this situation, while the others tend to be settled in it. A correct, uh, in this context, Brazilian cinema had to deal with its dialect of being and not being the other, of conforming to the other or having reinventing what they represented from the standpoint of its own, of moving close or to moving away from the other. Cinema Novo, a movement that takes place during the ex this extended 1968, would be one of those response to the state of underdevelopment in Brazil. But unlike previous movements in cinema, such as the chanchada of the 40s and 50s, Cinema Novo did not seek an, adap an adaptation or a conformation to that condition. On the contrary, it wanted to criticize that condition, to put that condition in a situation of crisis. A criticism which was both thematic, focusing on the extreme inequalities of the country, and also formal, confronting the conventions on scripting, acting, photographing, editing, and, direct, and directing proper to the hegemonic cinema of the time. One of the landmarks of the Cinema Novo, 
perhaps its apex and also the beginning of its end, is the film Terra in Transit, directed by Glauber Rocha and released in 67. A film that faces, or at least exposes, the impasses of a left-list political practice in Latin America, but that also exposes the authoritarian foreign presence in the country in close association with the military that had given the COPE in 1964 in Brazil. It is fitting in this sense that Caetano Veloso affirmed that Terra in Transit was the greatest single influence he felt on him when he was composing the song that would come to be called Tropicalia, the opening track of his first solo recording and considered the initial mark of tropicalism one year later. According to Caetano, his song Tropicalia was as close as I could get to what was suggested to me by Terra in Transit. But apart from his films, Glauber Rocha also reflected on writing about living and about creating in an underdeveloped country. In the hunger estetica, the estetica da fome from 1965, he points to hunger not only as a constitutive symptom of, underdevelopment, of the underdevelopment, as the geographer Josué de Castro had already pointed out in the 1940s in his book Geografia da Fome, Geography of Hunger, but, also, but hunger also as an element of originality of Brazilian culture and in particular of Cinema Novo, as opposed to the conventional hegemonic cinema. Glauber Rocha assumes hunger as an element that, apart from or because, because of its perverse effects, would give the instinction to the national production, as opposed to the digestive tendency present in a, cin in a cinema that you would be content to imitate cinematographic codes coming from outside. He advocates making ugly and sad films, which somehow resemble the dead, ugly, and smiling child in the lyrics of the song Tropicalia. Because for the filmmaker, only a culture of hunger, a culture that would take all the implication of hunger seriously, would paradoxically undermine the causes of hunger. And the noblest cultural manifestation of hunger, he says, is violence. It is, the, is, the inter, is inside this interval between the weakness that hunger causes and the explosive power of a politics of hunger that Glauber Roja envisages the nucleus, the core of the Cinema Novo project. Some things that evokes the phrase with which the artist Elio Itisica concludes his seminal text, Esquema Geral da Nova Objetividade, General Outline of the New Objectivity, also from 1967. For a diversity we live. That would be the condition of the underdeveloped. This phrase not only affirms the ability to respond creatively to the difficulties of material survival in Brazil, but also advocates a vitally contrary position against any inequalities in the right to affirm distinct point of view, points of view, free of political, economic, aesthetic, or moral constraints. And it is in this context that Oitsika's phrase, Oitsika's praise for marginality as displayed in his famous flag, be marginal, be hero, be a hero. This praise for marginality is justified as a desperate search for authentic happiness, which was related at the time when it was formulated during the regime of exception installed in 64. It was related to the absence of institutionalized ways to mediate conflicts, to the prohibition or to the negation of politics. It was a praise for marginality justified in a context in which the fundamentals of democracy had been suppressed in Brazil. It's also by Elio Sica, as it's widely known, the work whose title, K 
came to baptize in 1968 the song Tropicalia. Caetano Veloso was warned by friends that his musical project was somehow, was somehow related to the work of Oiticica exhibited in the group show New Brazilian Objectivity at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro in, in April 1967. Tropicalia, which is another landmark of this intense period, was the first appearance in Oiticica's work of what he called environments, or structured spaces for participation. In these spaces, these environments, the artist, or the motivator, as he began to call the artist, would take advantage of all the possibilities and creative strategies and offer a platform for the free invention of the spectator, or participator, as he also began to call the, the, the spectator, granting to the environmental art a changing and unstable character in which the act of creation was now associated with the proposition of a creative attitude offered to the other. Tropicalia was a direct outcome of Oiticica's familiarity with the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. The experience of walking through the shanty towns, snaking through their huts and alleys, was emulated by him in this built environment through the presence of penetraves, penetrables, which were labyrinths of wooden fabric with narrow passages articulated by, by paths of sand or gravel. The improvised houses in the poor neighborhood he frequented, both original answers uh, to a situation of lack and evidences of the inequality of access to housing, were also invoked in the constructive arrangement that shaped those works. Articulated through elements of nature, besides, besides sand and gravel, foliage and live birds, these penetrables formed an environment ca capable of offering those who walked barefoot the sensation of being treating the earth, evoking and sharing what, according to Oitsika's testimony, he himself felt as he walked through the alleys of the favelas. It's interesting to emphasize here the creative crossings narrated so far. If Oiticica's tropical environment envir uh, inspired the title of the song that opened Caetano's first solo album, that song was, in turn, an attempt to, of translating in music form what, he compo what, the com what the composer had felt when watching the film Terra in Transit by Glauber Rocha. To formulate even tentatively that somehow which articulated the works of Oiticica, Caetano, and Glauber, or Tropicalia, Tropicalismo, and Cinema Novo, it's necessary to return a little to Glauber. In a test written in 1969, Tropicalismo, Antropologia, Mito, Ideograma, Glauber explains something that still today causes some discomfort, discomfort to researchers of the period. Tropicalismo, he says, is a name that means nothing, as Cinema Novo. And he goes on with what is the essential point of his text. What would be, what would be significant, both in Tropicalismo and in Cinema Novo, would be the point of view adopted by the artist before something that constrains but, but also challenges the artist. That is, the fact that the artist creates under the constraints of an development and also taking into account the potency, the vitality that this situation provokes, that situation entails. The fact that the artist created from an environment marked by hunger, from a situation both physical and symbolical, that weakens, but that at the same time fortifies those who are exposed to it. That would be the main question, the main important point about Cinema Novo e Tropicalism for Glauber. The point of view, the place, the location, the accent, if you want, from which the artists created their works. 
It would therefore be less a matter of a repertoire or conceptualization and more a question of affirmation of a specific location place here determined, determined by the condition of underdevelopment. As Glauber Rocha said, when the country discovered underdevelopment, utopian nationalism went into crisis and fell. That is, when it became clear that Brazil was not following a route that would necessarily lead to the development already enjoyed by other countries, it would only be left to Brazilians, writes Glauber, to overcome underdevelopment with the means of underdevelopment. The important thing for the filmmaker would be to assume an attitude towards colonial culture that's not a rejection of Western culture, but one attitude that generates a search for an original aesthetic result that wants to be eman emancipatory. Maybe we could formulate it as an anthropophagy performed by those who are hungry. This attitude is the great novelty of Cinema Novo, just as it is the novelty of tropicalism. It is also the novelty of some productions in the field of the visual arts, and not only of the work of Elio Sica, but of Ligia Clark, Ligia Papi, Ana Maria Maiolino, Antonio Dias, and soon after those of Arthur Barrio, Antonio Manuel, Antonio Dias, Cildo Meirelles, and several others as well of singular expressions in the theater of the time, such as Teatro Oficina, since then directed by Zé Celso Martinez Correa. An attitude that is linked, that's connected to the recognition of underdevelopment as a condition, not as a passing stage. A condition that requires an active posture of understanding and confrontation, if one wishes to overcome it one day. Exactly as Celso Furtado was already saying back in the 50s in the field of economics. An attitude that recognizes and admires the other, be it the foreign, pop music, counterculture, European cinema, folk art, or mass culture, but that resignifies the other from what is at hand and close to one's all experience of life. An attitude that continually subverts given boundaries, being therefore a constructive method, as Otisica used it to say, and which is valued more as a gesture than as a formal invention, so that the creative process sometimes matters even more than the result. A constructive will that relates to the search for characterizing a singular place in the face of hegemonic cultures, that relates to the quest for an, um, uh, for an emancipating singularity of the experience of underdevelopment. It's interesting to note that if the relationship between art and underdevelopment was clearly identified by Glauber Rocha, there is no similar reflection from the field of music of the period. None of the main protagonists of tropicalism was concerned with formalizing the intentions or the features of the movement that so briefly connected too many in the late 60s. There is no manifesto written by the artists directly involved in that troubled creative moment. Although, of course, the recording Tropicalia Excuse me. The recording Tropicalia, Panis Essences, from 1968, functions as a collective sonic manifesto. There are, however, two tropicalist manifestos written and published even before the releasing of this recording. Both have as main author, Jomar Muniz de Brito, a poet, filmmaker, philosopher, and educator from Recife in Northeast Brazil. Jomar met Glauber in the late 50s in Salvador when he was assistant, assistant director of Patio, one of Glauber's first experiments in film. He also acquainted with Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil from their trips to Recife in the mid-60s. 
He had also created, he has also acted as a professor of philosophy at the Federal University and as an educator in the popular culture movement in connection with Paulo Freire before the coup in 64. Attentive, uh, attentive to what was just beginning to be known as tropicalismo, Jomar wrote the first manifesto tropicalista from discussion with the musician Aristides Guimarães, who at the time promoted the gigs performances called the Strange Sound Laboratory, Laboratório de Sons Estranhos, a manifesto that was also endorsed by the film critic Celso Marconi, who published the manifesto in April 68 in the local newspaper, newspaper where he used it to work. And the interest that the manifesto title is both affirmative and diffident. Why we are and why we are not tropicalists. And although there are several inter issues that could be addressed from the manifesto, for the purpose, purpose of this presentation, I'd like to draw attention only to items six and seven of the text. We are without subservience with Glauber Rocha, José Celso Martinez, Nelson Mota, Gilberto Gil, Caetano Veloso, Hélio Itzica, Adão Pinheiro, José Cláudio, the avant-garde poets. All that is legitimately new. We recognize the transience, transit and trance of tropicalism, along with the danger of commercialization, mythification, mystification, and idolatry. In the same way that say down with the festive, we add down with tropicalist fanaticism. Inscribed in, this, in the provocative form of the manifestos of the artistic neo-avant-gardes of the period, it emerges an awareness of the risks embedded in the movement, risks of subservience to its owners or inventors, and of cooptation by the cultural industry. In this sense, this first manifesto is true to the idea of underdevelopment that limits, but, at, but that also challenges life. But it's in the second manifesto, published in July 68, in the same newspaper, and at this time signed by several artists from Recife and, and from other cities that were passing through, among them Gilberto Gil, Caetano Veloso, and Os Mutantes, that the connection between top tropicalism and underdevelopment is made explicit. In the most relevant part of the text, entitled Inventory of Our Cultural Feudalism, the signers talk about something else, about that something else that simple labels cannot say. What is tropicalism? A position of critical and creative radicalism before the Brazilian reality today. Cultural avant-garde as a symptom, a synonym of militancy. The introduction of new creative process, the use of mass culture with the purpose of unmasking and overcoming underdevelopment through the explosion of its most acute contradiction, seen with free eyes. Again, an attitude, a position of critical and creative radicalism, an attitude to take positions short of and beyond the established besides taking into account the conditions of an undevelopment, a condition understood simultaneously as an obstacle and as an opportunity to generate original discursive and performative thinking. It's the same feeling of taking a critical and creative attitude towards an oppressing state of things that we again appear, even if differently, in texts, in essays, on short texts, that Eliot Seeker writes in the late 60s and early 70s, a time in which the experience of tropicalism is already exhausted, with two of its main protagonists in exile, in which Cinema Novo weakens as a collective project, and in which Eliot Seeker himself, himself spends most of his time outside Brazil. A moment of even greater political repression with the introduction of Institutional Act No. 5, I-5, and the beginning of the period of most brutal state violence against those who opposed the military dictatorship in Brazil. 1968, as an extended year for house utopias, 
was not yet over, but in the early 70s, it seemed to be nearing its end. It is the moment in which the government wants to interdict by force the acidity and transforming joy joyfulness and the energy that had characterized so many artistic inventions in the previous years. In the face of this siege, which somehow is happening again today in Brazil, the censorship and this violence against culture, which included censorship, persecution, and prison, the way out for several artists was to transform that joyfulness, that energy, that transformative vibrancy into abjection. It's well known that for psychoanalysis, the concept of abject designates more than a disgusting and specific materiality. It designates, broadly speaking, a situation in which meaning collapses, or a situation in which there are no clear boundaries between what belongs and what does not belong to, one, to oneself, or between what is part and what is not part of oneself. It's a term that helps to understand, for example, some of key words made by Brazilian artists in the early 70s. And I'll just give you two quick examples. The first of the one, Ligia Clark's Baba Antropophagica, or Anthropophagic Saliva, from 1973, in which someone's body is gradually covered by threads which are pulled from over participants' mouth until the point that there is almost no distinction between what is a body and what is an object. Second, one example of the few works the artist Artur Barrio did in the early 70s, which also confounded what was one thing and what was another thing, thus symbolically relating, relating to or representing this somber and uncertain period in Brazil. To produce the work, Barrio prepared 500 plastic bags full of the most varied waste, dejecta, and fluids, including blood, saliva, and shit, but also food leftovers, sawdust, and photographic film. Following this preparation, he abandoned, abandoned the bags at different locations throughout Rio de Janeiro. But his expectations were that each of these bags would prompt psycho-organic responses from the spectator, as he understood the body and mind as undivided receptors of stimuli. Faced with these bags full of things that do not symbolically fit together, and which supposedly ought not to be where they were found, the passerby would experience a disintegration of the classificatory categories that separate garbage from non-garbage food from inorganic matter, what attracts interest from what repels interest. This passerby passers-by, were, were to be faced, at least for an instant, for a moment, to an act of resistance to a normative social order hegemonic in both the public and private realms. And finally, a work by Sildo Meirelles, made in 1970, uh, Tiradentes, monument, monument to the preso politico, to political a monument to political prisoner in which he burned ch chickens alive uh, as a protest uh, for the situation in Brazil at that time. And as a reference to one of the historical, famous historical uh, figure in Brazil, Tiradentes, who was on the face to fight for the independence of Brazil in the late 18th century. By transforming, so these are as works that are example of a situation that was common in Brazil in the early seventh, uh, late sixth and early seventh, and by transforming the pulsating and emancipatory energy of the late sixties into acts of abjection, Ligia Clark, Artur Barrio, Sildo Meirelles, and other artists brought together and made it to coexist in their works both their connection to what Brazil meant to them, what Brazil is made of, and the rejection of much of Brazil represented at that moment. A paradoxical strategy that is the antithesis, that's the contrary 
of the dichotonomous slogan of the dictatorship at the time, addressed to all who disagreed of the direction then given to the country. A slogan that read, Brazil, ame ou deixo, Brazil, love it or leave it. In texts whose syntax is increasingly fragmented and the lexicon often invented, Eliot Sica coined by that time, but at the same time, the idea that Brazil would be the subterranean or the underground world. And although he describes subterranean as the underdeveloped, underneath as a rat, there is no negative connotation in this characterization. Rather, there is the will to affirm the position from which one lives and from which one builds something in a country increasingly subjected to a conservative and violent logic, both internally and externally. Faced with an environment that favors the dilution, the dissolution of what is specific to one's life, Oetisica proposes to assume a critical position that considers the ambivalences and contradictions of living and creating before the adversities proper to the condition of the underdeveloped. A position that does not want to deny the colonial condition to which Brazil is subjected, but that does not want to preserve it either. A critical position which, on the contrary, wants to assume and to swallow the positive values proper to the, this condition, that wants to defeat the feeling of impotency that such condition entails and to construct something new, something that did not yet exist. For Itisica, Brazil's cultural formation would be diarrheal, the result of a flow of excrement expelled from a social body that is hungry and eats everything that lies ahead. The hunger, perhaps, of which Glauber Rocha spoke. The hunger that is satisfied only through the hasty violence of the hungry. Faced with this singularity, Oetisica sees only two possibilities. Either diarrhea is, is repressed and a national constipation is produced, a metaphor for the most regressive ideas in the country at the time, or is it necessary to dive into the shit? Mergulhar na merda, to build another possibility of Brazil. An underground construction was perhaps, he seems to suggest, a strategy to combat the condition of underdevelopment. And to finish, I'd like to just say that to speak of half of this in view of Brazil of today is almost also to wish that the year of 1968 could be extended until 2018. While it's true that the term underdeveloped is almost no longer found in economic books, this change did not take place because the structural inequalities between different countries or different regions have come to an end. Rather, inequalities are being restored all the time, condemning millions of people to a condition of lack amid the wealth that relations between and within those same countries and regions promote, generate. The term underdevelopment was, has gone out of circulation because, once again, the idea that underdevelopment is a stage to be overcome by the poorest countries, by their force to produce more and more, is again hegemonic. The neoliberal lexicon in this context prefers the designation of emerging countries, but not that underdeveloped countries, suggesting a transient situation of inferiority of some countries to others, and not a permanent or long-standing condition. Maybe it's time for Brazil and other countries to think of themselves again as underdeveloped countries no longer with the almost ironic resignation contained in the protest song made in the early 60s, as it was the case with the song of the underdeveloped, but rescuing from that same decade, decade and the beginning of the following that extended 1968 that extended year, rescuing from that time the constructive will amid the condition of subalternity, 
reinventing for the days of now the ability to imagine again the impossible. This time, however, with the certainty that you are in the middle of the shit. Thank you. Without further ado, we'll follow with the next speaker of the afternoon. Um, wait. Right. So, I'm very happy to welcome our next speaker, uh, Lena Bader, that is coming to us um, from Paris, where she works at the Center for Art History, uh, Ger German Center for Art History. Um, right now, chairing under other projects a very interesting titled uh, Traveling Art Histories, Transregional Networks and Exchange Between Latin America and Europe, which I find an amazing uh, title for a project. Um, but um, very briefly, I think it's interesting also that Linda does have a Brazilian background as well as we were talking about earlier, even though very international in her um, in her life, uh, but does have this uh, connection to Brazil, and I'm very happy that she's here today to talk to us about uh, Sildo Meirelles and the uh, rebellion of the well-versed images. Thank you very much, Lina. Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to express my warmest thanks for, for the invitation to this um, conference, to this other 68 conference. It's not only a pleasure, but truly an honor to be here. Um, a real honor um, and also a big challenge. Um, for While I'm very interested in the topics being discussed here, I've only been dealing with them for a few years. So my background is more in German art historical tradition of Bildwissenschaften, of image science. And I came across the Anthropophagia movement um, a few years ago only as a postdoc. So I guess I followed a different path from those of the majority of experts in this room. Nevertheless, I hope I will be able to contribute to the discussion as an, um, let's say, interested outsider for whom Brazilian art history has offered important arguments to rethink a rather Eurocentric canon. I mean, Victoria Langland said she felt panic to speak here, so I cannot even begin to tell what I'm experiencing right now, but I tried to do my best. 1928-1968. On one side, the modernists who called for cultural anthropophagy and on the other side, the artists of the so-called barricade generation. Their connection is perhaps not immediately obvious. The colorful landscapes and countless floral motifs Tarsila do Amaral had painted early in her Pau Brasil and her Anthropophagia faces seemed to return later at best as a problem. Para não dizer que não falei das flores, not to say I haven't spoken about the flowers, became the leading protest song in 1968. Geraldo Vandré delivered his message quite queerly. To quote Christopher then, symbolic protest marches and flower powers were useless in the face of armed forces. Vandré was calling for armed resistance. In Brazil, you all know that 1968 marked the fourth year of the military coup d'etat and at the same time a dramatic radicalization of the dictatorship following the draconian Institutional Act 5. For many artists, including Vandré, exile was unavoidable. In fact, the realities of 68 and 28 were worlds apart, especially for artists. Yet, particularly in the context of Tropicalia music, it has become customary to speak of a neo-anthropophagic vogue. In this talk, I would like to explore some of the points of intersection, especially with regard to the visual arts. I'm, of course, not going even to attempt to provide an overview of 50 years of Brazilian art history. Instead, I will use a few rather well-known examples to take an in-depth look at certain aspects in order to consider the ways in which they could be connected. Thus, what I'm presenting here is more of a mosaic than a puzzle, and a mosaic that could be assembled in a variety of ways in which I would try to form along some of the topics mentioned in the expose to this conference. And this brings us also back to the three points uh, marked yesterday by Vincent Sediger. 
the question of counterculture, especially in arts, what would be counter art be? The question of emancipation from centers like Paris and the idea of anthropophagia. I'd like to begin with a well-known example, the Coca-Cola project from Sildo Meireles' series, Insertions into Ideological Circuits. Quote, to, regis to register informations and critical opinions on bottles and return them to circulation. The call for action was part of the artwork. It could only be seen, however, when the bottles were refilled for sale. In other words, no exchange, no artwork. Medele's own messages, partly in English and partly in Brazilian, include sayings like Yankees go home, as well as instructions for Molotov cocktails. He is said to have personally printed over 1,000 messages. The project was created for the information exhibition in New York in 1970, where it was first shown. To quote from the catalogue, Considering the general social, economic and political crisis, it may seem too inappropriate, if not absurd, to get up in the morning, walk into a room and apply depths of paint from a little tube to a square of canvas. What can you, as a young artist, do that seems relevant and meaningful? This addressed a fundamental dilemma to watch Meireles was quite reserved. Quote, I had problems with political art in which the focus was placed on the discourse, thereby making the work seem like propaganda. His skepticism must be seen in the context of the time, namely as a reaction to often dogmatically recited demands for a revolutionary art and critique activism and, and artistic activism. And so that brings us back to what we discussed today in the morning, uh, the refusal of leadership and, and, and of dogma, especially. One of the bottles directly poses the question, which is the place of the work of art? Escaping to the autonomous world of l'art pour l'art was not an option, especially not in times of dictatorship. What was needed here was an alternative between formalism and representation in order to balance artistic practice and political engagement. In 1968, Meirelles was 20 years old. He is part of the same generation as Artur Barrio and Antonio Manuel, to whom Claudia Kaliman dedicated her study of Brazilian art under dictatorship. So they are all younger. You probably know that then Elio Oitisica, then 20, uh, 31 years old, and Lydia Clark, 48, who had both paved a critical path with their neo-concretist explorations. And here too, the system of art is questioned through art. The focal point is not a finished work, but a project that, though it began in a museum, calls for participation rather than contemplation. In times of censorship, the public is asked to become an anonymous co-author. No central creator, no central authority, and yet there is creation. Uh, to borrow from Georges Didier Übermann, it may be an artwork in spite of all, and first and foremost, a work of art created in spite of censorship. Medelis presents messages, but does not enforce a doctrine. The work is left open, and the question a symptomatic one, which is the place of the work of art. The inclusion of Coca-Cola bottles was an effective lead that misleads, as Sully Rolnik so fittingly described it, una pista que despista. The bottles refer to an art historical context and thus may offer protection from censorship, but also go far beyond it. The discussion this triggered, however, point to a formative double bind with respect to how Brazil, or rather Latin America, is still approached. The focus is placed either on projection, imitation and import, or instead on marginalization, difference, or even exotism. Thus, the concept, concept of ideological conceptualism tries to point out a specifically Latin America version of conceptual art. Alternatively, attempts have been made to connect it to a seemingly global art discourse by comparing it, for instance, to US American pop art. And both positions are, of course, highly problematic. 
especially with regard to Coca-Cola project, others spoke of guerrilla strategy of anti-art or inverted ready-mades. Medelis himself introduced two less loaded associations, messengers in bottle, thrown into the sea by victims of shipwrecks, or graffiti that moves. Accordingly, the question, which is the place of the work of art, can be understood in a variety of ways. Politically, with regard to censorship, art critically, with regard to new non-objects, but also in the context of historiography, of international debates, and even society. Two years earlier, the band Os Mutanchis brought together US entertainment industry with Afro-Brazilian religion in their ingenious song, Bachi Macumba. In a minimalist lyrical feat, Batman and Macumba are placed in relation to one another in ever-evolving ways. Despite all the criticism of the United States' support to the Brazilian, of the Brazilian military dictatorship, which led, not least of all, to the famous boycott of the Tens Biennale in 69, the art world did, did not cut off all contact. It was, however, not random, as Caetano Veloso explains in Tropical Truth. Quote, Tropicalismo must be seen in part as a natural reaction to the old pro-French cultural orientation. One could say that French culture was confused for us with Eurodite culture, and we wanted then to oppose it, oppose it to American culture, which came to us primarily through mass culture. The contrast is consciously schematic and even polemic, as all sorts of other motives were also involved in British and in Brazilian ones. Yet this aversion to France, or rather to a certain image of France, addresses a decisive moment in Brazil's art history, which would ultimately lead to the scandal of 1922. In 1922, Brazil celebrated 100 years of independency. In the course of the official festivities in Rio de Janeiro, new and old works dealing with the nation's history were celebrated. One of them... Uh, One of them was a historical painting by Victor Meireles, a former student at the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts. The painting is titled The First Mass in Brazil and was first shown in Paris at the Salon in 1861. Although part of the political iconography of the empire, it served as an important icon during the first Brazilian Republic, for it materialized a national myth. The image unites Portuguese and Brazilian people and while both groups adopt different attitudes towards the religious service and their surroundings, they seem to be in harmony with each other. No violence, no oppression, no exploitation. As Edith Wolf convincingly stated, this depiction of a Brazilian myth of origin is based on a French model. Stylistically, it conforms with the guidelines of the academic art training, and ideologically, it follows the dictates of a European history of progress. The painting reinforces the official historical version according to which the discovery of Brazil was a peaceful act. It is against this backdrop that one must see the scandal caused by the modern art week in Sao Paulo. With its alternative historical images and different concepts of art, beyond Romanticism and beyond Neoclassicism, it was, in many ways, a counter-event to the official celebration in Rio. And most important, it proposed an original way of dealing with Europe and also, especially, France. For this, I would like to discuss an example that not only resulted from travel, but has specifically dealt with it as a topic. It is Vicente Durego Monteiro's Quelques Visages de Paris from 1925, a thin illustrated book that, as the foreword explains, is based on an Indian chief's impression of Paris. The chief gave the sketches and notes he made in Paris to the author when the two met in the Amazon, and Rego Monteiro then edited the book, adding an opening legend in order to translate some of the motives the Indian chief used into a language that uh, refer, re reference, amongst other 
um, the pre-Columbian Marajoaran culture. First published in Paris, the book was not published in Brazil until 2005, which then gave rise to a series of examination by Jackson, Wolf, Greet, and others. The book contains 10 illustrated poems. The old Trocadero complex, for example, is described as the house of a great warrior with trophies and embalmed enemies of war. Although it is not specifically mentioned in the text, the reference made to the colonial objects in the Musée d'Ethnographie du Trocadero is explicit. I, I translate, it was with an immense tightness in my heart that I saw my ancestors in such strange positions. And these are some of the exhibited figures from the American gallery to which the traveler from the Amazon may be referring. What he expresses here, however, is a noticeably different attitude than that of the avant-garde artists of his time. In that enthusiasm for primitivism, they rather emerge as a, some sort of unkind accomplices of exploitation. Quelques visages de Paris delivers an original answer to the illustrated books by travelers from past centuries. The Indian, usually the object, the object of observation, passive, immobile, and timeless, now takes on the role of an international traveler, is involved in exchange, and explores unknown territory. He does so, however, with the help of an at least bilingual artist who travels back and forth between Brazil and France. And to make things even more confusing, the foreword suggests that Rego Monteiro himself may be the man from the jungle. What takes place here is a highly creative debate about the assignment and representation of cultural identity. The foreign gaze, one's own gaze, the Indian, the Frenchman, all these container terms are put to the test, culminating in an enigmatic vignette that concludes the foreword. In this case, no instructions are given on how it should be interpreted. The question of what is supporting what remains open. Is it the American continent occupying Paris' Arc de Triomphe, or is the arch holding up the new world? Either way, they are connected. In view of this narrow contact zone, we may consider if the strange Eiffel Tower slash Indian tent might also be inspired in a contemporary experience. According to the text, the traveler from the Amazon believed that the construction had to be secured with ropes to keep it from tipping forward. In truth, however, antennae had been attached to the tower. The new technology of radio telegraphy, radio telegraphy had made the already modern construction into a pioneer in media history leading to Europe's first broadcast of a public radio program, with all of its uh, global connotations that you can see here, the first world center wireless. It may be possible that Rego Monteiro is exploring this dialectic of modern slash archaic by directly combining, like an palimpsest, an Indian tent with a radio tower. These kinds of anachronistic confrontations are found throughout his work and contradict theological histories of progress. Not to take it too far, but even the station's logo could be an interesting pendant to the opening montage. Two representations dealing with transfer and transmission that each depict transcultural processes of exchange in a different way. In the French example, the Eiffel Tower with its antennae is almost like a futuristic virgin of mercy embracing the entire world. In Rego Monteiro's example, on the other hand, linear connecting lines are no longer in place. And neither Brazil or its capital city are shown as the center of the world, but instead the continent of South America, which would, which would bring further associations into play, including regional ones. Much like the way in which the song Bach Macumba Brazilianized Batman and simultaneously underscored the modernity of a non-folkloric Afro-Brazilian religion, in Rego Monteiro's work, one may say, Paris is Amazonized, revealing the modernity in the designs of prehistoric indigenous cultures. This actualizing gaze not only runs counter to Europe's exotizing primitivism, but also and primarily to Brazil's neo-colonial Indian myth. 
Rigo Monteiro thus expresses several of the modernist's fundamental motives. Regardless of the discussion of whether he should be assigned to Indianismo or Anthropophagia, the underlying principle remains the same. It is not about rejecting Paris or France, but a particular image of France that correlates with neo-colonial motives of thought. And to at least show it once, um, this reveals an interesting alternative beyond isolation and imitation. In this respect, anthropophagia can actually be consulted as a theoretical position, especially since it is built on the idea of an avant-garde as a community of memory, to use a term coined by Abi Warburg. To P or not to P, that is the question. This programmatic key phrase of the manifesto is an emblematic play on words. It sums up the manifesto and at the same time implements the project in a performative way. With its acknowledgement of the anthropophagic, the manifesto unmasks the neo-colonial Eurocentrism of Brazil's elite. While popular whitening theories promise to gradually improve the country's population, bringing it from dark to civilized, and while romanticized visions glorified the figure of the noble savage in constructing Brazilian founding myths, the manifesto strikes back with the help of the white savage. The power of the manifesto lies in the fact that out of this Brazilian problematic, it cultivates important points of intersection with international issues. The wild thinking contradicts the great modern narrative and its linear theological success story of civilization. Not only does the primitive undead return, but the cannibal even becomes a kind of resistance fighter against nationalist shortfalls. The projected goal, however, is not a reversed form of colonization through which Europe resources would now to be exploited. Although, although this would invert the balance of power, it would preserve its structure to live on in form of a Brazilian imperialism. Instead, it is more about shifting the ideological pillars that support the dynamic of disparity from the within. So no inversion, but transformation. Far from any kind of universal, um, yeah, and, well, this could also be applied, of course, to the, to the famous paintings by uh, Tarsila do Amaral and, and so many others. Um, far from any kind of universal design, a form of cultural identity is being explored, one in which exchange and authenticity go hand in hand. Out of the concession of the reality of a society shaped by colonization, immigration and exchange, a model of sovereignty is derived that is not only capable of acknowledging the other, but also knows how to interact with it. No universalist unifying term, no optimism about globalization, but rather a kind of community of memory which claims to derive its power out of a conscious retrospective of its own history, including its taboos and traumas. In this sense, anthropophagia was more than the celebration of a transcultural counter of encounter. It was a spirited campaign against historical amnesia and ideological usurpation. At its core, it opposes any illusion of self-sufficiency. Anthropophagia represented the utopia of emancipation through interdependence and transformation. This, however, did not stop the misuse of Indian myths in service of openly fascist, fascist projects. And even Medele's happy colonization fairy tale became famous once again when it was tied to one of the most prominent image vehicles. From 1943 on, the painting was featured on the back of the Thousand Cruzados bill, the highest banknote at the time, with a portrait of Pedro Álvarez Cabral on the front. And the notes remained in circulation until 73, with a stamp uh, declaring it un cruzado novo from 67 on. And neo-colonial discourses, of course, were even reinforced in the 1960s by the policies of the United States, not least of all in Vietnam. In this light, Frederico Moraes' response to Mereles Coca-Cola project seems all the more pessimistic. Instead of answering in the classical form of a written text, he responded with an artistic intervention. 
He installed 15,000 empty Coca-Cola bottles in the room of a gallery in which Medalis had recently exhibited two of his inscribed bottles. These two bottles were incorporated in the installation and were exhibited on a table in the middle of the sea of bottles. A small sign informed visitors that the empty bottles had been donated and delivered by the Brazilian Coca-Cola company. 15,000, that was 15 times more than Medalis himself had inscribed. The intervention stands in the context of active discussion about the possibilities and limitations of criticism. Accordingly, Moraes referred to his form of interaction as a nova critica, a form of poetic criticism through which the critical mythology was to be revised. Despite the poetic liberties taken by this new criticism, the artistic intervention is usually interpreted quite unambiguous. As Gerardo Mosqueira stated, Moraes was implying that it is impossible to infiltrate the circuits as they will always devour you. In fact, the balance of power between the supremacy of ideological circuits and the triviality of critical interventions seems blatant. Even Moraes himself steered his interpretation in that direction in subsequent statements. In view of the power of authoritarian regimes, there was evidently no reason for, to have much hope in the efficacy of artistic interventions. Yet, the question arises whether this David and Goliath-like matchup could be looked at in a more optimistic or at least more dialectical light. That is to say, less as a statement and more as a question. Are artistic interventions futile in the face of the supremacy of the consumer industry, or does it actually offer a sea of possibilities in the form of bottles yet to be inscribed? For these are, of course, all empty bottles. Even more important than these different interpretations, however, is that here an attempt is being made to employ a new mode of criticism, one that not only questions the role of the artist and the art form, but also how to think about art. In this respect, it is telling that in the majority of reproductions of works by Medalis, Otisica and others, the body, of course, or at least the hand of whoever comes across the artwork is shown. Criticism and practice go hand in hand. This is especially true for the Cédula, the banknote project. The project was part of uh, the exhibition in New York from in 1970 and was always described by Medalis as the most important series of all his insertions. Once again, and you probably all know that, um, Medalis uses a high-profile circuit, but one that, unlike television or radio channel, cannot be centrally controlled. The resulting symbolic space of descent, as Elena Stromberg refers to it, proves itself to be an effective metaphor for art symbolic space of descent. The mobile banknotes are well suited as a medium of artistic intervention, which is by no means dematerialized, but which for the most part uses foreign materials. With his stamps, Medalis attempts to disrupt an established and at the same time unavoidable circulation. He creates an irritation that is intended to challenge consumers and viewers' passive attitudes. These do-it-yourself works, along with the works of Otisica and Clark, strive to be participatory works of art in direct opposition to a dictatorship that denied the rights of citizenship. Parallel to the Banknote project, Medalis and others created far more provocative works, and Moacir dos Anjos uh, just showed some of them, the Bloody Bundles uh, from Artur Barrio, or the, the Tiradentes Tote Monument. But the fact that the interventions function without breaking taboos and without shock value seems noteworthy. It is a highly creative work that, in spite of censorship, shows an understanding of how art and criticism could be brought together. Just how effective this clandestine action art was became clear at the latest in 1975 when a new message was introduced. After the journalist Vladimir Herzog was tortured to death by the police and a death masked uh, as a suicide, Medalis entered a series of banknotes that asked the question, who killed Herzog? The impact of the insertions stems precisely from their simplicity. 
Like a virus, they cause, they cause chaos and irritation and explore the fragility of hegemonic structures. They are evidence of the possibilities of a minor art and its power to shake up, or at least question, large systems from the inside. Here, affirmation and subversion go hand in hand. And I think Elena Inez yesterday said something very similar in um, relation to her libertarian style as a mix of affirmation and indignation. In this context, the series Insertions into Anthropological Circuits offers an interesting commentary, which once again addresses the question of the inefficacy of art. It consists of fictitious banknotes for zero cruzados and zero dollars. On one side, the Brazilian bill shows an indigenous person, and on the other, an inmate from a mental asylum. Two representatives of ghettoized communities who placed, were now placed in the public light. Or as in the manifesto, the anthropophagic manifesto says, the transformation of taboo into totem. It is yet another acknowledgement of outsiders. After the primitive and the cannibals, two more victims of institutionalized violence, two anti-heroes who remind us of the dark side of modernity, so powerful repressed by Medele's long-term occupation of the thousand crusado bills. In dialogue with Anthropophagia and Jacques Derrida, Silviano Santiago has developed important points of criticism against a still acute neocolonialism present in the humanities. According to Santiago, the cultural history of Latin America could contribute to the critical examination of concepts such as unity and purity. One might see here yet another form of nova critica, that is to say, criticizing the authority of the critique and being conscious of the fact that the critic too contributes and participates at ideological circuits. My intention here is of course not to suggest any direct line linking uh, Rego Monteiro and Medeles, especially considering that in terms of their politics in the 1960s, they could not have been uh, more opposed. Furthermore, there's a series of works that are far more directly collated with the Anthropophagia movement, and we just saw one, um, Lydia Clark's Baba Anthropophagica, or Lydia Papi's film Eat Me, and so, so many others. But what interests me here about looking at these two side by side is the idea of disrupting established orders. While musicians inserted Tropicalia into the media of radio and television, Medeles inserted his project into other circuits, and Rego Monteiro proposed a creative intervention in the existing genre of voyage pittoresque. Medeli's idea of mobile graffitis offer a striking, striking concept, one of nomadic reproductions that incite productive irritations and evoke repressed messages. These, in the truest sense of the word displaced views, have an inherent critical potential. Like creative parasites, they summon the strength to disrupt large-scale systems from their experience of oppression and marginalization. This is true for the modernists who, from a position of exteriority, developed an avant-garde concept that was critical of modernism. And it also pertains to artists threatened by censorship who developed effective modes of participation from a position of weakness. In both contexts, politics and poetics are intimately intertwined. What is astonishing in both cases is that no new isms were coined. No new system or alternative dogma, but art that precisely does not limit itself of merely offering a counter model. In the face of countless attempts at monopolization, artists claimed agency through their artistic interventions. It is precisely in the way they draw from what already exists that these works express their sovereignty. Vehemently, they rebel against the illusion of self-sufficiency. They object to any semblance of autonomy, and in doing so, develop their creative artistic potential. Out of the uncontrollable, anarchistic energy that is ultimately inherent in every encounter. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
So I think we'll uh, slowly get back um, to our presentations. I'm very happy that our third uh, Palestrant of the afternoon is Max Jorge Hinder de Cruz. He uh, is an author, art critic, theorist and curator living currently in Rio de Janeiro with a broad uh, body of work on Helio H. Sica, among other um, productions. Um, and we were already very happy to count with Mark Max's uh, contribution to the lecture and film series at the Film Museum about a month ago or a little bit more, um, talking about Neville de Almeida Mangi Bang. It was uh, an amazing experience to hear him and watch the film. So I thank you once again for that talk. And I'm also looking forward to see what you're going to bring us tonight, today. <laughs> we're still during the day, not so fast. Uh, so please welcome with me, Mark George Hindre Cruz. Thank you very much. I would like to um, to thank, first of all, uh, all of you in, in the audience for, for coming and uh, you know listening. It's an important thing to do. Then uh, also to, to the organizers, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Paola, Vincent, uh, Laura, also Lily, and everyone here involved with the technique, with the museum, with the you know with the catering, with helping us and accommodating us. It's been uh, really kind. I, repeatedly here now, and I, I feel very at home. Thank you for making it possible that I'm actually here. So um, I, I've been, uh, I had commented on this before, uh, I've been kind of um, touched by uh, the circumstances, let's say, and, and, and also what I hear from people, and I thought I, I, I would like to rethink a bit what I wanted to present and talk about. I wanted to talk about uh, Elio Tisica uh, with uh, the title, I think, on um, the talk, which is called New Alliances, New Sex, New Cocaine, which uh, I hoped would draw a lot of uh, uh, public, um, which seems to have worked out. Yeah, so, so that's good. Now I can uh, tell you that I'm actually going to talk about something else, and uh, which, which will include uh, a New Alliances, Sex and Cocaine, though, and this is the important part of it. Um, but I would like uh, us to think Perhaps we can discuss that broadly after, um, taking that I'm the last speaker today, we could perhaps you know, discuss. Um, think about what, what we actually want from 68. Right? And I'm going to talk about Elio Tisica. Um, um, so uh, there's three things I would like to talk to you about. First, I'll put my watch on so I know uh, how, for how long I'm already talking. So there's three points I would like to talk with you about. The first one is uh, what 68 are we actually talking about? Second question is what Elio are we actually talking about? And the third question would be what do we want to, what, what do we want to talk about 68 for and how? So uh, first of all, I think it's important um, that we think of, of, of the narratives we create, right? We, we, we create narratives and uh, in the end such a, such a conference might draw afterwards a, a, a publication which might be published with, let's say, an important publishing house and then it makes history. This is how things go, right? If we, for example, would make a, a conference on topic like 68 in Brazil, we publish it with, uh, 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 with Duke University Press, for example, then we have like a, a publishing house that is big in making history of what we call like the post-colonial studies or so in a very hegemonic context. So this is where history in the end ends, right? This is, this is history. So we have a certain um, uh, 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 responsibility, let's say, as I think people who participate in those processes of writing history on uh, what, what we're talking about, how we're talking about and what we want from it. So these are the three points I would like to, uh, uh, to, to point at. First of all, I wanted to say that I really um, thank El Moisir for having given that very you know, uh, incredible ground for me to build up upon because we have, we're talking about slightly different time periods also. And I just mentioned that um, what I'm going to talk about for me personally makes perfect sense with what Marcy was talking about this, what I would call now, excuse me, third worldism, right, of a certain generation. 
uh, in context to what I want to point out. And I will probably, different than Moisir, just give you a totally blunt, subjective perspective on that. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, So um, 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 when, when I first saw the, the work of Elio Tisica, I was in, in, in Vienna. I studied art uh, in Vienna before I studied uh, philosophy. And I don't have any uh, formation as an art historian, so I'm not going to talk to you as an art historian. But when I first uh, saw Elio Tisica, I went to the Museum of Modern, Moderne Kunst in Vienna, MUMOK. It was 2003, and I there was this exhibition called X Screen Expanded Cinema in the 60s and 70s or so, curated by Michael Michalka, I think. Um, and I went into this installation, which you can see here on, on the photograph, and it struck me, right? I saw this, I'm, you should know, I grew up in Bolivia. Uh, uh, so I'm half Bolivian, half German. However, I live in Brazil, as you know, I just heard. Um, so all my life I had a relation to hammocks, very, I passed my childhood in a hammock, basically. You can imagine it like this. So I, I got into this installation, right, in Vienna as an art student, young art student, and I see these hammocks and these slide projections and these sounds. And I realized, okay, that's uh, slides of uh, a Jimi Hendrix cover of an LP, which later I found out was published only posthumously, which is called War Heroes. And it has on, on this big face of, of Jimi Hendrix on the cover, it has these carefully laid, uh, uh, traced um, lines of cocaine powder that would be drawings. And on the slideshow, on the multiple slideshow, these drawings would change and they would evoke uh, something like war paint on one. Uh, they would have some geometric figures on another. There would be slides with matches of a Coca-Cola match, little thing uh, with the Coca-Cola logo on it and the cocaine next to it and fire and the loud, you know, Jimi Hendrix crazy psychedelic fat sound and, uh, uh, and the hammocks. And I thought, wow, what, what is this, right? Cocaine, like, I'm, I'm a Bolivian, you know, they, and, and I, I figured, I figured, you know, the, the coca is a holy plant to us, right? To all... And Dian peoples, the, the coca leaf is a holy plant. So I saw it and I like to compare it with, I thought, okay, you know, they're doing to the coca leaf what Caetano did some years just before them with his guitar, he electrified it, right? Like they electrified the coca leaf and now it's cocaine powder and it's all laying there, crystally shiny, and they do these drawings and you have this electric music and it's the same thing that actually Jimi Hendrix in a, in, a, uh, in a famous performance in 67, I think, right, the very Jimi Hendrix did in a performance in 67 when he, in Monterey, when he set his guitar on fire with a big, what in Brazil we would say, like a big macumba, right? There was this, excuse for the word, but there was this electronic voodoo that Hendrix would do, he would put fire on it, and he would sing, I'm a voodoo child, right? Baby, I'm a voodoo child. Um, I'm standing in front of a mountain, and I chop it down with the edge of my hand, and I take the pieces and build an island instead. That's a hymn to the power of unified black people in diaspora, right? So that's the picture per se. I chop down the mountain, I build an island, and there we are, I'm a voodoo child. So that was very impressive to me. Then afterwards, I found out, I started researching on Elio Etisica, which led me 10 years later to publish a book on the Cosmococcus. Um, and I figured out that first of all, there was a lot of people uh, researching Elio Etisica and who wrote a lot about Elio Etisica, but I seem to be one of the very few who like this work. And um, most of what I would call established art history don't, right? Um, I'm going to zap you through some images. I'm going to do this every now and then to zap you through a few images. Elio Chisica did this work, this is important, um, together with Neville D'Almeida, who actually 
created uh, 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 the name and the concept. So Neville is the author together with Eloetisik of this series of slides. I just didn't mention Neville before because I actually gave the whole talk on Neville before. So I was kind of, since I talked only about Neville first, I wanted to talk about Elio today. So forgive me about that. Um, so they did this. I'm going to show you some slides that are projected in different situations. Um, this is uh, Cosmococa 5, Hendrix War. You see some of the slides that were projected in this environment that I just showed you, with the hammocks, right? Um, all the works are from 73, actually. It's a complex thing, I'm not going to. It is said that the works are from 73, right? Okay. This is another uh, work called uh, CC3 Mailerin, which is a, a fusion of Marilyn and uh, Mailer from Norman Mailer, who, did the, who wrote this biography. You can see here the book. And, um, and this was installed with, uh, with this vinyl floor with sand under it, where, and these balloons, yellow and orange, and people are supposed to roll themselves on the ground. And, be delirious. This is the first Cosmococca CC1 trash escape piece uh, with uh, Luis Buñuel with the cocaine cut through his eye as a big reference to Anshi Andalou. And uh, the perhaps most formal one with uh, as the, the uh, uh, likeliest uh, to, to gain uh, valuation by uh, established art histories. This one, which is very you know, reduced, minimalist, and which is called uh, CC4 on occasions, in reference to John Cage. So then I started um, doing all this research, and I found two uh, uh, crucial references to me who uh, uh, built up Elio Itisika. So we have as a figure. So I, what I, I would like you to think with me about is that Elio Itisika was, even though he was successful as a, as a young artist, unfortunately he died uh, 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 much too young, but as he was already during his life uh, exhibiting at MoMA, uh, at Whitechapel in London. So he, was, he had an international recognition, but the big Elio Itisika the one with the big retrospective here at MMK or at the Whitney Museum, uh, etc. That big Oiticica is a construction, allow me to say so, of the 1990s. It's a posthumous construction um, who was, just as history is being made, who was created by a certain set of figures uh, that are relevant to a certain discourse of a time, and this Elio Oiticica was posthumously created as the figure we know him about, who nowadays might be regarded as probably one of the most important Brazilian artists of all times. So, um, and most visible internationally, right? So, uh, um, Elio, in, in 92 there was a big retrospective, which toured around, which was still curated in partnership with a group of friends of his, who included still Ligia Papi, Wally Salomão, Luciano Figueiredo, the Valentin brothers, friend, close friends of Elio Itisica who had lived with him, etc., and who were setting up um, his, uh, um, together with the family, the, the, the uh, estate of Elio Itisica. So they collaborated with international curators to, to do that. Later, two persons who, who, who uh, 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 contributed to establish Elio Tisica as this crucial international reference where um, Luis Kamnitzer in his referential book on what he called Latin American conceptualism, um, that was a term that was pretty on vogue at the turn of the 1990s and 2000s to kind of internationalize conceptualism. And there, there, there was a big exhibition at Queen's Museum of Art in New York where Kamnitzer also was involved with um, for the Latin American section, uh, there was called Global Conceptualism Points of Origin. So just earlier, uh, Kamnitzer had written this substantial collection of what he considered to be Latin American conceptualism, and there he figures very prominently Elio Tisica as like a crucial figure for the whole thing and body of 
what Latin American conceptualism would be. And as you can see here, he, he, seems, he seems to not, not think that it's important to consider the works when he actually went abroad from Brazil, away from Brazil. This is crucial. We keep in mind, away from Brazil is very important, right? Um, and after Luis Kamnitzer, who curated the section on Latin American in the uh, 1999 show, uh, first of all, there was in 1970 the Elio Tisica participation at Documenta of Catherine David, which was also where Ligia Clark and Elio kind of became these super stars, right? So, so then, in, in, I think in the year 2000, there was a Generali Foundation in Vienna at that moment, still under Sabine Breitwieser, the exhibition Vivencias, Lebenserfahrung. In 2002, at the New Museum in New York, Carlos Basualdo, uh, the Argentinian curator, curated a show called Elio Chisica Quasi Cinemas. And another myth, uh, the, the expression Quasi Cinemas was, as I'm pretty convinced, uh, invented by Carlos Basualdo to, to describe actually these works, which are the slideshows of Elio Tisica. Elio Tisica himself never spoke of his works as quasi-cinemas, but he only, as far as I know, described a slight projection of Jack Smith in New York in a 1971 letter to his friend, uh, 72, sorry, uh, uh, Wally Salomon, saying this is quasi a cinema, what he's doing with the slideshows, okay? So, um, but it drew big attention. So I think more or less this is the frame, and then the 2007 big retrospective at Tate Modern and at Houston Museum for modern art or contemporary art. I'm not entirely sure, but there's Maricarme Ramirez, who did uh, first there in Houston, and then in Texas, and then in, in uh, uh, London, this big retrospective that was supposed to be a two-part retrospective, which was the first part should have been called The Body of Color with a big catalog from where this, uh, this um, phrase is taken. And the second part was supposed to be called the space of the senses. And the second part would be Elio Tisica's work from 66 to the end of his life, while the first exhibition was only till 66. The second never took place. As you can see here, for her also, in her view, the phase from the moment when Elio Tisica actually went into exile uh, was one that was not, probably not that exciting anyways, right? Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see, and there's a lot more people, uh, more so you can, uh, uh, more so you can, more so you can uh, I think, uh, confirm that a lot of people in Brazil just don't like so much the, the, the New York works, you know, they're not as popular. And uh, um, so this is interesting. Why, for me, is it interesting? Because I think that uh, we, need, we need to understand how these things are being constructed, right? There's a certain set of people who like or don't like certain works. Now I would like to talk with you about what the possible reasons for that would be and what the implications of this is. Um, let me just see. All right. Okay. So the... Um, so it's always been talked about a, a before and after exile, and exile happens to be the year 69, which, which is, let's say, instantly after the Art uh, Institucional Número Cinco, which we've heard a lot about. 69 is the moment when people who could afford it went away from, from Brazil, right? Because of the severe repression that was happening. Um, I read a lot, Elio Tisica went into voluntary exile. I would like you to remind there is no such thing as voluntary exile, right? Uh, people who went into exile uh, uh, were afraid that, like their friends, uh, to be uh, captured and tortured, right? To become, in, become insane, go to mental hospital, like uh, um, people, we're talking about people of this very countercultural movement we've been talking about all the time. Rogério uh, Duarte uh, went, went, uh, was tortured over days. He has a, a, a fabulous description, incredible description of what the torture was, uh, which was published here at the catalog of the Porticos. Actually, we were talking about Porticos at the Rogério Duarte show that was here. The, uh, 
I think the text is called A Grande Porta do Medo. It's, it's, uh, um, if, you, if you would wonder what torture is like, um, get the text, it's impressive. So Rogerio, but also paid with his sanity, he uh, went to mental hospital and had severe problems afterwards. Uh, um, Sueli Holnik, who has been uh, uh, here uh, quoted and, and referenced a lot in, in the paper, of, uh, was, uh, was taken uh, by, by the police, right? Um, and and uh, was uh, abused in a way that she says that uh, her whole singularity, uh, uh, subjectivity got totally annihilated. She went off to, to, to Paris the first moment she, she could. Right? Uh, the the um, Torquato Neto, close friend, poet, of all these guys and girls and you know people, he uh, uh, had severe uh, uh, mental health problems in '72, committed suicide in Rio de Janeiro. So the the situation was horrible, right? And if your choice is that thing that happens to my friend might just happen to me, or I go away, then this is not a voluntary exile. So this is an important fact because the same art historians that say the work from 68, uh, 69 on, like after 68 of Elio de Sica, is not that important, not that satisfying, it's more decadent, and it's voluntary, right? It's volu he, he went because he, he wanted to, and then he made this work, which we don't like, so let's keep it out of the narratives of, of art history. Um, this, this is crucial to understand. There's no such thing like voluntary exile. And uh, I can tell you, because we are living in, in moments, very difficult moments in Brazil, and it's, it's obvious you see how the people around you who can afford it just leave. You know, try to get a grant in, in, in the exterior. Um, go do whatever anywhere else. Move away from Rio, which is particularly difficult right now with the military... Uh, uh, temporary military government we have right now. Uh, and however, um, so Elio had to leave for, for the sake of his health and his, his life, right, as others. And Elio formed part like that of a big network of people who were all these countercultural but also political people who would go into exile and would start produced in the exterior. So some of the crucial films of, of Bel Air, who've been shown here, they were actually edited in, in London. As we heard from uh, Neville too, Mangi Bangi was edited in London. Um, uh, Transa from Caetano Veloso was recorded in London. It talks about London. Uh, um, so we have all these, uh, all these crucial, let's call it crucial works of, of the counterculture which are actually produced elsewhere and not in Brazil. Since there's some people that are interested in creating this kind of pure Brazil uh, uh, profile, um, the difference between not in Brazil or in Brazil is one that needs to be adapted, right, to, to the means of creating a Brazilian identity and, and also an artistic identity. So, now the interesting thing for me is to think about the following. Right? What, uh, what 68 are we talking about to get to my first question? Um, uh, I hope I... We'll, Time-wise, we... Okay. Um, the, to get to my first question, the, the thing is... So... These people, they experience like an immediate post-68 elsewhere and not in Brazil, right? The ones who, 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 are, who are living in exile. But what is 68 for Brazil? And I think this is a very interesting thing. Now that Victoria, unfortunately, she's not here, I would have liked to discuss her, her main thesis with her. Um, since we've heard like half, half of the Brazilian population, women have been kind of written out of the history of 68. Uh, another interesting thing is that the other half, if you want so, in Brazil is not, not white, right? it's, it's black. Specifically, like according to the last census, uh, the majority of the Brazilian population is from African descendants and self-recognizes themselves as black. Um, this is people who self-recognize, declare them. Um, 
what, what was, let's put it from this way, 68 for the majority of Brazilians, right? And the question that I would rise, um, raise is, what difference does it make 68 for the majority of the Brazilians? We've heard about uh, the, the story of, of uh, uh, women, which I also think that uh, uh, Moisid again this, this morning uh, mentioned. Well, why, why, we don't have to go so far to find women involved, like the, the, the president, the very president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, the last democratically elected president of Brazil, was, uh, uh, was a victim of torture and, and the 68 political movement, right? So we were talking about prominent people. Beyond uh, that, I would like to, to remind you that, that for, for, for the, for the Afro-Brazilian population, 68 was not a relevant, was not a relevant year. Right? The, the repression of, of uh, the black population, the repression of uh, their, their spiritual circles and of uh, activism was repressed long before. Long before, in 68 was just one another year, where they lived in repression anyways. Some, some crucial, absolutely crucial figures of, of, uh, of the movement, let's say, um, Abdias do Nascimento, for example, was in exile. He was in exile. Nobody would say Abdias do Nascimento was voluntarily in exile. He was persecuted, right? And he was living in exile. And he was, uh, since the, the, the 40s, a, a, a leading figure of, 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 of the black movement. I, I would like you to remind also that... Um, that Abdias do Nascimento, and this is probably important for the black movement in Brazil, 68, what was important for the Brazilian movement of 68, of the black liberation movement, was that, for example, Abdias was in New York, and he would paint a painting in 69 saying, free Yui, right? Free Yui meant free Yui P. Newton, one of the main leading figures of the Black Panthers. So while in 68 uh, the Afro-Brazilian population lived under absolute severe repression, some of the uh, activist leaders of the black movements in Brazil were supporting the Black Panthers in the US and were connected. Because as you might know, in Paris uh, and in the US, anti-colonial struggle was a key key element in the 68 composition. We all know that in, in, in Paris, the student revolt raised from basically an absolute political unsatisfaction with the uh, Algerian war involvement of, of France, right, and de Gaulle and so on. So th there, was, there was a total link with an anti-colonial uh, matter. And in the US, 68 was the year when, when Tommy Smith and, and Juan Carlos raised their fists with uh, in Mexico City in the Olympic Games, right? Taking off their shoes, going there. So there, there were some people who really got uh, involved in that. So in, in Brazil, the representation of black culture was the only viable thing. Uh, some, someone like Abdias do Nascimento was crucial for that, but let's also think that 68 was not only, uh, uh, or, or 1970, was not only Caetano and and Gio also, for the matter of sake, and, and Gao, and Maria Bethania, and, um, but it was also, soon to come on the stage was like uh, Chimaya, Elsa Suarez, you know, uh, um, th these were crucial figures to, to keep in mind that, that were a, a kind of counterpart, right? So I would like to say 68 in Brazil, if we think of an extended 68, until when do we have to think? What kind of 68 do we, do we have to think? And I think probably I will get to this on, on the end of, of this talk. It would be more interesting in Brazil to talk of 1978. So, right? I think that 1978, depending on what we want from 68, would be much more interesting to take as an example. So what do we want from, from 68? What do, like, what do we expect from 68? What 68 do we mean? Do we mean exactly from January to December? of that calendar year, or do we uh, would like to think of a, a, a very singular 
phenomenon in political history, uh, 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 even uh, in, in large parts of, of the world, not only in, in uh, uh, Paris and, and, and the US, as we heard, uh, but also in Mexico, talking about Mexico and other places, um, it is a coming together of what, to make it just very uh, uh, short and, and, and easy, it's, it's the creation of what we would consider a new left, right? So it's new social movements getting together to create a deep political impact that we call, call the new left, if we, as we have heard before, um, things such as uh, the feminist movement, the LGBT uh, uh, movement, uh, black liberation movements, anti-colonial movements, um, they all fall into the same with the students, with the workers' unions, uh, etc. We have this, this uh, um, coming together of forces which we call a new left. So if, if that is what we identify as a phenomenon and we would like to discuss that, I would propose that we think, if we're interested in Brazil too, we, we, we just might shift to another year where a lot of interesting artistic stuff too happened, and, but then really, you know, really the feminists and the black liberation and so on, uh, uh, the anti-psychiatry uh, uh, movement, and, and they would all really get together to do that what Sueli Rolnik and Felix Guattari rightfully so called the molecular revolution in, in Brazil. They're not talking about 68, they're talking about beginning of the 1980s. Actually, 82 was the year when Felix Guattari, invited by Sueli, traveled the country, and which has, has as a result, this fantastic uh, book and, and uh, insight in, in the times and, and in exactly that fluctuation that uh, uh, some identify with the founding of PT, the, the workers' movement, you know, Lula and Dilma's uh, party. But it was just simply exactly that moment. And uh, um, so 68 was in Brazil most of all um, not that it was unimportant, but it was, uh, it, it was simply, it, it, it was, if we speak about 68 in Brazil, we might run uh, you know, the risk of reproducing automatically social mechanisms of segregation that were at stake in 68, which is we will end up talking, nice, right, yeah, you still hear me or should I make a break, I'll take a break, okay, I see I'm, I'm, I'm I should get to my second question, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm handle this, I'm gonna handle this. So Abjir Zonacimento was connected to the, to the Black Panthers. Um, the second important Afro-Brazilian who was uh, well known in the US and to other 68 movements globally was uh, uh, Carlos Marighella, who, who, who was a, a guerrilla fighter who wrote the, the, the manual for like, urban guerrilla, which is a, was kind of a bestseller, right? In, in, published in, I, th I think in 69, I'm not sure. Hmm? If someone knows it, correct me, please. So, however, um, in 68 now, however, I don't want to be all kind of, but we have to talk about, uh, uh, in, in that extended 68, let's say extended 68 would be um, from 64, let's say, to 78 or so. They were black artists, right? Like, art history doesn't really see them, and there were black artists who would deal with, with black identity. For example, uh, Ruben Valentin, who is actually probably the most famous one, who was a constructivist artist, if you like, right? Just simply an Afro-Brazilian one. Or Emanuela Araujo, who is Araujo, who's, who's very famous for being, uh, not at least, also a curator and museums director, not only an artist. And very close to, to, to Elio, there was uh, also, if you like, uh, Raimundo Colares, who is never being considered in that kind of way, but he was someone that I think should be taken into consideration. More recently, there's, there's a, a, a younger generation who is probably interesting, you should look it up also to, to rethink, like uh, Rosana Paulino, or here next door, uh, Ayrson Heraclito, who is being very visible recently and who is a great, fantastic artist. Um, however, there's a lot, uh, you can see to, to think about, you know, what, 
what could be the moment when these things come together? Because I, I realized I'm, I'm, I'm relatively short on time. Um, so, so I would like to, to make it faster because the, the most important thing uh, uh, was exactly that. What, what kind of um, 68 are we talking about? So the Elio that I'm most interesting, uh, interested in, I want to say it you know, very open as I uh, uh, announced, it's a subjective view. I like the, the 1970s Elio. So what happened to Elio after, and this happened to many Br uh, Brazilians in exile, they went to exile and they discovered the feminist movement. They discovered LGBT activism. They discovered black liberation movements. They discovered anti-colonial struggle, which were things that in Brazil were totally suppressed. And only when they would all come back, right? Die Belez, Glauber, uh, uh, Abgias, Elio, only when they all, would all come back, something would consolidate. This is around the same time. It's what, what you call in historically the, the opening, political opening of Brazil, the, like the announced, announced end of the dictatorship. So end of the 70s, these things get into motion. You know, and then you have, the question is not, like, the question is not when did Caetano Veloso let his hair grow? I would say we need to ask when did Elsa Suarez get an afro, right? This is, this is, you know, this is the 68 we need to look for. And as far as I have researched, Elsa Suarez got it um, in 72 with her album uh, Elsa Page Bass. Um, Okay, so the, the Elio who went to New York, he got, he started doing all these works. I do have some pictures. I'm going to step through just to get the, the, the images I wanted. First of all, ah, this is important. Um, Elio, di, or Elio di Sica, this is a crucial point I also forgot, but this is super important to understand. Elio di Sica is, as a Brazilian, as we have, the, most of the population like is non-white in Brazil. Uh, now you can make uh, uh, the count your, yourself, the math, do the math yourself. Uh, most of the Brazilians also have a, a black grandfather or grandmother, right? So um, this is the case for Elio. Now Brazilian segregation systems are totally different from that in the U.S. We hear that a lot when we talk about racism, etc. Uh, while in Brazil it's all a more sophisticated, integrated kind of class uh, 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 repression system uh, that also uh, passes through very different handling of, of uh, uh, abolition and liberation, etc. Um, in the U.S. you have a one-drop policy, right? So to, 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 to make it short, when Elio, as a perfectly white Sonasul Brazilian, goes to Manhattan, after a year he doesn't have any money anymore, his residency permit is about to expire, he speaks very well English, but he speaks with a very strong Brazilian accent, and he on the street is just a Latino. Uh, so he goes through that experience of from being a very privileged person. He still continues to be, well, let's say rather privileged, but he continues to, to experience what it means to not be part of a, a, a hegemonic cultural dominant uh, enclave. So this also changes his perspective on things, and then he starts to identify, for example, uh, uh, with, with Mario Montes and the uh, uh, artistic work of Mario Montes. And this is also something important we need to think of. Like, uh, uh, Elio just is, uh, it, Elio was just not uh, essentializing, right? And Mario Montes is a good reference to think about how he would uh, uh, identify with a, with a, with a transvesti, transvesti, like drag queen artist from Puerto Rico who had a, a double life. Well, we have uh, the absolute Mario Montes specialist in the audience, Mark Sieger, who I have to uh, um, thank a lot for actually meeting Mario in person and hearing with Mario together a tape he recorded with Elio Itisica of about one hour of talking, which was wonderful. Um, that was in, when was that, 2011? No, I think it was 11. 
So just this, and, and this is a photo that already uh, Carlos Vergara made for Oiticica. And uh, this is Mario Montes' participation in, in Elio's famous Super 8 movie called Agrippina Homa Manhattan. Um, he called this the, the Wall Street Oracle, which he wrote like, like this. You, well. um, these are photos I also owe uh, to, to Mark's uh, generosity. He, um, well, however, I, 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 important is that he identifies with the work of uh, what uh, Juan Suarez, a dear friend of ours and brilliant researcher on not only tropicalism but also uh, uh, the, the, the queer underground of, of New York uh, avant-garde film has called uh, Smith's tropicalism. So, um, so Elio openly admired Smith's tropicalism and Mario Montez most of all. And, um, and you see here in his loft he has installed this I'm not sure if Puerto Rican or Cuban flag. I think it's a, it's a hybrid. It's like deliberate. He had this uh, loft. And, and then he, he starts not only identifying with the, with the migrant body, but he also starts to be openly gay in his artistic expression, which is also new, right? Which is also only from exile on. First, when he's 69, goes to London. Uh, he starts thinking about these things and noting them down. He has numerous texts on these things and he starts scratching this idea for films because in exile he didn't have the space to produce these huge wooden structures he did in Rio. He didn't have a house in Jardim Botanico anymore with a huge garden. He had like a, a New York apartment which he generously called loft. But you know, if, if you've been, I've been in front of the house, it's, it's not a loft, it's a, it's a New York apartment. And, and um, which he totally rebuilt. Um, and there he had these boxes installed, which derived from a work he exhibited first in, in, the, U, uh, in the UK and later at uh, uh, MoMA in New York, which was called Ninos, which is like nests. He installed them at home, and there he received all these people. And all these people are boys and men, uh, and, and which. Uh, uh, another friend, and, and probably the only other researcher next to Juan, uh, and, and, and me who have published on, on the queer Oiticica, if you like, uh, uh, which is um, uh, Rodrigo, he um, has this, this essay called The Golden Boys of, of Elio, which is uh, Osni, uh, yeah. And he started doing this pin-up boy photography, right? He had all these boys he would pick up on the street, in the park, on, on, on uh, St. Mark's place, and he would bring them into his loft, and then he would make photos with them, and he developed this slideshow called uh, Neirochica from 73, where he has 88 pin-up slides of boys that he most likely slept with, which have a highly charged erotic, let's say, content. Um, and, well, here you see some notes of his. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to another thing that, and he also he had these filmings of, of, uh, um, of the gay parade in New York, like big, uh, like he filmed this, like these huge amounts of LGBT activists. So he was really into something, and he was also very interested in a transsexual body, as you can see here, one of his big New York projects, which was uh, to be called New York Cases and later Conglomerado includes, in his notes you see, excuse, well, no, it's his language, I don't have to excuse. So he, um, I don't know, can you read it? It says, transsexual cunt photos, Luciola, question um, mark. A, a guy with his head back to the camera slides down the girl's slip. B, the guy, same position, hands on each of the girl's thighs, while she opens her legs, showing newly operated cunt. C, girl's new made cunt being penetrated by the guy's prick uh, in close-up, right? So these are kind of things you have to imagine Elio Tisica was thinking about in 1975, right? At the same time, he was revisiting his earlier works, which is probably something that art historians didn't like. So what does an Elio Tisica in forced exile who gets uh, uh, to see the black liberation movement? Uh, Arthur Lindsay told me that, that he was a big admirer of the Black Panthers, right? 
and he had a Brazilian friend who was together with these Black Panthers guy, and he was always after him, according to Arthur Lindsay. So, um, so he uh, um, identified with that other. He had a sympathy for, for LGBT movement, uh, as he writes in, in a letter also to uh, Luis Fernando Guimarães in 71. He is impressed by the feminist movement, and, and, and you know, he writes that to a friend in, in Brazil, like saying, you know, what we have here, this is interesting, you know, like, I don't understand what's going on in Brazil, but you know what you get here, this, you know, this is something that people should know about. So he publishes about, you know, the queer New York scene and so on. And, uh, um, and he revisits his famous Parangolés and makes this kind of gay pinup stuff out of it, where you see uh, his, his boyfriend of that time, or one of his boyfriends, uh, uh, I think he was called Romeo, I'm sorry to, to have not, not entirely sure. Um, he, he makes these things, and the Parangolé, the other version of the Parangolé in 73, is he goes to, to the metro and, and looks for black people in New York to wear the Parangolé in some sort of weird, to me, not entirely logic, but kind of pan-African gesture, right? Um, um, it's, it's the only way I can read this. And he made a, a 16 millimeter film of this, which unfortunately, I was uh, um, in the de developing the film material, the celluloid, there happened something and it's, uh, what in German you call überbelichtet, what is that? Overexposed. So unfortunately, this material is unviewable. It exists, but you barely recognize anything. It's all gray. I think uh, uh, Cesar Otsika feel it giving all these insights. Um, so this Elio in New York, who revisits his parangoles, who revisits, um, as I would say, his cosmococcus are uh, newly thought bolages also, because they are installations where you, where you could hang out like he had before already with the bolages. Right, he had these gamma bolages which is actually in, in, in London. He would make this tent, Gilles and Caetano tent, in the travel number five, in which you could hang out and listen to tapes, Tropicalia 68 tapes, and hang out in exile, basically. And, uh, and he would have this evolution of, of, of the body, this also, I think, which should be considered, right? He made these photos of his cocaine, uh, and he made these, so, okay, so a, a post-68 subject, an artist and creator, Elio Tisica, through this experience, right, he comes, uh, um, revisits his whole oeuvre and thinks, we, we have to take things different from, from now on. So what, what we have to think now is like, uh, um, to make a mix, I want to conclude, uh, of, of a, a, cell, a, a famous phrase of Franz Fanon and one of Charles Ludlam, which is an interesting mix, I think. <laughs> the playwright and actor and theater director Charles Ludlam, uh, who defined camp once as um, an outsider's view on things others take totally for granted. Right. So Elio Itisica, um, who, who coined the term tropic camp, and was friends with Charles Ludlam, who uh, admired and respected his work and the whole theatre group's uh, work. Um, we could mix that with Fanon's famous conclusion of the wretched of the earth, saying, now, comrades, now is the time to think of changing sides. So we could think of, you know, seeing the very own Oitisika like a person who comes from outside and has a totally new view on things that others take for granted, that is Elio Itisica, taking Elio Itisica for granted, like if we could just have a new look at him, right, and eventually change sides. In this case, changing sides would also mean to profoundly question what the date 68 serves for in the Brazilian context. And if we don't uh, meet all again in 10 years and talk about 78 in Brazil, thank you very much.